Before the next episode of XJob Downloaded starts, I have a big favour to ask. If you've enjoyed any of our episodes so far, please can you click on the follow button on your platform. I'm on Apple, Spotify, Google, Amazon and YouTube. It costs nothing to follow, but makes a real difference to me as a podcast producer. Thank you. My name is Paul Maleri, and for 30 years, I served with Essex Police. During this time, I interviewed suspects for murder, abduction, rape and extortion, plus a variety of other crimes. Now, I interview former police and military personnel and anybody else who has an interesting story to tell. Sit back and listen to X Job Downloaded. This interview is being tape recorded. My name is Paul Maleri and this is X Job Downloaded. And today I'm going to interview Peter Bayliss. Now, Peter Bayliss is a former photojournalist, went on to work with the Metropolitan Police and has taken photographs of some of the most iconic people in the world. Good morning to you, sir. Good morning, Paul. Thanks so much for taking part in this today. It's a, it's a bit random, isn't it, when you get a request from somebody saying, would you like to do a podcast with me? And you think, what on earth am I going to talk about? But you've got lots to talk about. But before we get into the nuts and bolts of it, where did it all begin for you? And how did your life evolve to a point where you joined the Metropolitan Police? Right. Okay. Well, I, I suppose... Um... I suppose really it goes right back to when I left school. Um, I always wanted to be a photographer, even though uh, on my one of the last week at school, the careers guidance master, uh, when I said that, he said, oh, I've got nothing for you there. I've got a, uh, an apprenticeship at um, um, a local factory. Um, you're good at metalwork and woodwork, I see. And um, the vicars, and my mum's next to me, and she says, "Go on, take it. It's got a pension at the end of it." No, nah, not interested, mum. I want to be a photographer. So with that, she was rather. Uh, <clears throat> uh, anyway, I went on to uh, work in uh, labs um, and studios uh, for the first couple of years. I was working two shifts, basically. I was my, I had my day job in the studio, and I went on to picture agencies and worked in their dark rooms, printing pictures, which they'd send out to editors on spec. Um, so I got to learn what was a what was a saleable picture. Uh-huh. Um, and then I graduated basically to uh, Fleet Street as a freelance photojournalist, and I was in my element. Um, I'd find a story, take lots of pictures on my Nikon F, uh, write it up and submit the film to a picture editor. More often than not, they use something with the occasional front page. Um, through the 70s, I shot well, movie stars, celebrities, rockers, <laughs> uh, politicians, and big shots. Uh, I was the official photographer in Miss World, and I get exposed in the news of the world. My first experience of fake news. Um, I was, uh, I was, uh, as I say, official photographer in Miss World, and following the um, contests around the country, we came to the Miss Wales contest, and. Um, I was photographing with the girls for about three days. Um, they're chattering away. I'm not listening to them. I'm concentrating on my pictures. Um, and then right at the last minute, Julia Morley, the organiser, she said to me, Peter, have you got a dinner jacket with you? Yes, I have. All right, do you want to be a judge? <laughs> uh, okay. You know, it's BBC televised. Uh, <clears throat> So uh, there I was uh, sitting out front and you had to turn away from the camera for, to start with. And then you're introduced and you spin around and, you know, smile. Um, Peter Bayless, photographer from London. And the girls come out and they see me there. 
Well, at the uh, party afterwards, one of the girls was rather peeved that uh, uh, she'd been talking to me for three days, and and you know I I turned out to be one of the judges. Oh. Um, so she spoke to the wrong person. She spoke to a journalist from the News of the World. So the News of the World journalist, his ears pricked up, bloke called Chapman, never forget him, and he got a story. Well, I got back to London um, <laughs> after being on the telly, and uh, my dad phoned me and said, uh, Pete, you made the News of the World. Oh, huh? what? How? He said, well, there's a big page all about you, spy amongst the girls, and there's a picture of you in it. <laughs> <laughs> they take they get taken a group picture and then crop me out of the picture just for the the story, and there was a lot of made up stuff in there. Now I'm in panic mode because I got this lovely little gig with the uh, Miss World organisation. Yeah. So Monday morning I ran down to her office and and said, Julia, I, look, I I didn't say this these things. And she said, Peter, Peter, don't worry about it. Don't worry, because. I can't buy a page like that. You know, look at this page. It's because it wasn't tabloid then. It was, you know, it was yeah. full fold. Um, and it's got Miss World. It's got my names in it. It's got, and I, that's when I learned there's no such thing as, as bad news. No, you know, there's only good news you can actually exploit. I'm just going to take you back slightly. Yeah. What year did you leave school? What, what year did you actually leave school? Oh, crikey. Um, let's see, 68, was it? Um, yeah, I think it was about 1968. When you were six, 16? Yeah. And Vickers, where was Vickers based at that time? You said Vickers that? Armstrong was based in Sidcup. Oh, okay. So you, you were a Bexley boy, born and bred, and yeah. Sidcup would have been your... Right, so you've did you have that passion for photography whilst that from school, the age uh, of eleven? Right, and do you remember what what your first camera was? Yes, I do. I still got it. Have you? What was it? It was a a German Pentona F three point five thirty five millimeter film camera. There you go. And for my eleventh, I was I was pestering my father for a camera, and for my eleventh birthday. Uh, he sat me down. He said, right, close your eyes, hold your hands out. And he lowered this camera into my hands and it was like uh, manna from heaven. Um, there I was with my first camera. And it, I think it cost him about two pounds, which for him on the wage he was on as a printer, um, it was it was very high. The, the price yeah, yeah. Was. Um, it wasn't just the cost of it. I mean, I cost him some fortune in film and processing. Of course. Thereafter, um, snapping away at school and and just just snapping, you know. Did you did, um, did you process your own films in the end? Yeah, oh, Dad and I set up a dark room uh, in the house. Um, so we're up in the loft, and uh, so yeah, I was I was learning how to process films and uh, do my own contact prints. Um, and we had to, my dad made, dad made an, uh, he was a wonderful DIYer. Right. And he made uh, an enlarger. Now, I don't know whether you, you, anybody would remember this, but back in the fifties, you had cans of powder, yeah. powdered milk. All right. And so he turned these cans into the enlarger. Uh, with some uh, old bellows that he found and a lens and the various other parts in wood. And it worked to a degree. Fantastic. Uh, I was able to actually enlarge a negative. That, so, that yeah. is so, I mean, that that's social history, isn't it? Because when everybody, is. everyone's a photographer now and, you know, they, they're using their phones and God knows what's going to happen with all these images. They'll just die with the people when they go. Um, but what, but what you've got is a tangible product. So you you're at school, and you're the kid with the camera. My first camera was a Zenith. Or no, that's not true. My first camera was a a, a Kodak with the I can't remember what size film it was, but it was a a long. 
it was bigger than the 35 mil and you used to have to... It would be a 120. 120 and you wound it on and that was my... And it was a fixed lens. That was my first yeah. camera and then I got a Zenith. My grandfather bought me a Zenith and I've been into... That, that, was, that was probably... The Zenith was probably my next camera um, uh, when I could actually afford to buy a camera myself. Right. I bought a Zenith and a Zorky. There you go. And, and, yeah. I, and I've still got... I've got a Hasselblad upstairs which my father-in-law bought in Singapore in 1952. And it's got, yeah. and it's got a yellow cover lens. So, it, 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 I mean, I've never used it. I wouldn't even know if it, it – I'm sure it probably still does take a photograph. But, yeah. I, and, it, and it's probably worth a bit of money. Yeah, it probably is. So you, you've got into photojournalism, but how did you make that leap from schoolboy to photojournalist? Well, as I say – I got a job in a color processing laboratory and studio straight out of school. Right. N Nagel Roma Color Studios. That was just off of um, St. Paul's right. in London. Um, and I was working there quite long hours, um, but I was learning my craft. I was learning to process yes. uh, films and prints and also into the studio to watch them take photographs and help i actually on the first elton john album uh tumbleweed connection i think it was right we we went down to a station uh somewhere in sussex and um i was standing around as the assistant to the assistant to the assistant as it were um i had no idea who elton john was and bernie torpin um but yeah, that was like my first photographic gig, uh, my first experience of real photography. Your um, first, your first celebrity. Um, yeah, I suppose gig. it was. Yeah, like I say, I didn't know the, who didn't know who the hell he was, but it was it was something special. But but you went on. I mean, when I look at your portfolio, some of the images that I've seen that you've taken, the likes of Dustin Hoffman. I mean, mm. how how did you get that gig, and where did those images go to? Well, I got a bit of a reputation for running around um, knocking on doors of uh, public relations people and uh, <laughs> managers and saying, uh, can I photograph so-and-so? Um, basically, uh, chutzpah on my part. Um, I was just, uh, you know, I was, I was um, we didn't actually... We didn't actually consider ourselves paparazzis, more social photographers. Yeah. I'd go to um, uh, film nights, you know, f film screenings and uh, open nights and first nights and uh, premieres, all that sort of thing. Um, we were a little pack of probably about half dozen photographers, all shooting the same sort of thing. Um, in fact, my... My the, the my best earner. I've just had a statement through from my picture agency, and it's sold yet again. And my best earning picture was about 1975. Um, I waited around. Everybody had gone. I waited around for the celebrities to come out of this movie, um, and out comes Eric Clapton and Patty Boyd. Wow! So I um, asked them just pose for me. Snap. That was it, done, dusted. Well, that picture has sold year after year after year after year. It's unbelievable. It really is. And I don't know why people are still using it, but they do. And I get a revenue for it each time. So Fantastic. that's cool. Um, and it, with Dustin Hoffman, uh, let's see. Yeah. Uh, uh, I can't quite remember exactly... I can't remember. I can't quite remember the the, the time I went to photograph him. What it was about, but it must have been to do with one of the films he was in. Uh, Anthony Hopkins was different because he came into the studio that I had, I had ultimately, and he brought Fats the dummy from the film Magic with him. <laughs> um, and for the first first five minutes, I found myself having a conversation with a dummy. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, he was wonderful. He really was. Uh, that, that, so, but that's captivating, isn't it? As I say, this is social history. Yeah. 
Who was the most awkward person that you photographed that, that as you know, I, I get them when they're not very happy because you've done the paparazzi bit, you know, you've doorstepped them or whatever, but somebody that's come into a studio, you believe that they're going to um, just acquiesce and be there to have their photograph taken, but they were quite awkward. Well, it didn't happen in the studio. It happened in South of France at the Cannes Film Festival. Right. Um, the, um, uh, what was his name? The um, uh, Bill from Kill Bill. Who's who was that? David Carradine. Yes. Now, first time I met David Carradine, uh, we went down on the beach and uh, we had a couple of beers and. He's playing a flute, and um, <laughs> I'm photographing him sitting on the rocks at the um, the end of the beach. Uh, it was really cool, you know, a nice guy. Well, the next year, uh, I go to photograph him. Oh, dear. What a change. Really? He becomes so full of himself and so difficult. Um, he really didn't want to do pictures, but I persuaded him. Um, and... You know, I got some nice pictures of him. Uh, the most, the one I thought was going to be difficult, because I, okay, back in the start of my career, okay, to basically fund buying equipment, I had this job which paid next to nothing at the studio. Night times. Um, I was occasionally working at a picture agency. Right. I was also a bouncer. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I worked as a bouncer for a group called the Marquis Martins. And uh, <laughs> we went around doing security in clubs where they had fired the bouncers. Right. So we were, we were like the tough boys who were brought in in case there was serious trouble. Um, and I, I was employed as uh, security for The Who. Oh, wow. Yeah, I did three nights with them at uh, the Lyceum in London. Um, and only recently did I, did I find pictures taken by somebody in the crowd of The Who at that gig. And you can just make out me. Fantastic. With a dicky bow tie, and <laughs> I, I didn't believe it. You know, after all these years, That's that must have been seventy-two, something like that. And because you went on to photograph the police, I mean, there's an irony there. But there is what? I mean, what was it like working for them or with them? Because for me. I, I, I still think they're one of the most iconic, along with The Who, you know, absolutely, I mean, I love absolutely love The Who, but The Police, a part of my, my formative years, if you like, what was it like working with them and where did you go? Um, well, uh, at that time I had a studio in St Martin's Lane and uh, almost everybody dropped in and um, uh, this French wannabe rock journalist Guy Robin used to pop in and use the phone and treat it as like a, a base <laughs> I didn't mind um, it was okay and then one day he said to me hey Monsieur Bellis you must come and see this new punk band they are really good yes and I said nah, not interested mate not interested in punk no 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 they're really good you've got to come and see them no, not interested. Uh, but there is this uh, lady. She is, uh, her name is Lali. She is Persian. She is beautiful. No? Okay, fine. I'll be there. <laughs> so Shallow. I trotted, along, I trotted along to a club in uh, Covent Garden, the Roxy, um, on the Friday evening. And this was the second UK gig ever. Um, and... I met the original guitarist, Henry Padovani, who was chatting up Lali at the same time. Um, so I, I, I got to know Lali and photographed her. Um, and, uh, but then he said to me, uh, uh, you've got to photograph the band. Um, okay, all right, fine. Uh, I thought, oh, yeah, I'll, I'll placate everybody and get a couple of pictures and then I'll get to meet this girl. 
<laughs> Absolutely. Um, and and so the band struck up on the stage. Um, the hairs on the back of my neck stood on end. What was I listening to? It was just unbelievable. It really was. Yeah. So you've got Sting, you've got Stuart Copeland on drums, and you've got this uh, Corsican guitarist, Henry Padovani. Um, so I, I, I jumped on the side of the stage and photographing them, etc. and the hand grabbed me and pulled me off the stage. And it was uh, the brother, Miles Copeland, the manager. Right. Uh, what are you doing? Uh, well, that bloke there, he said, come and photograph the band. Oh, okay, fine. Um, and thereafter, we got on okay. <laughs> um, but I, I followed them around. I think within two days, I'd taken them out around to Covent Garden and um, to a photo session in the streets. Um, and then I followed them around for various gigs. Rock goes to college. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, and uh, I was booked to go to the States from the re- by the record company um, to Boston and New York to CBGBs. Yep. Um, and yeah, it, it was it was great, it really was. Um, Did you go to you went to CBGBs? Yeah, yeah, CBGBs, which is where but the, I, the bl- that's where Blondie, Talking Heads, yep. the Ramones, all those fantastic bands exactly. basically got their break. Yeah, but I wasn't at the time aware of the history. No. It didn't compute with me at all. No, of course. So I was just there to take pictures of the police and have a bloody good time. <laughs> well, yeah. Um, so, yeah, and, 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 you know, Stuart Copeland was, was fantastic because one evening at his hotel – um, he explained to me his background and his family history with the CIA and all that sort of thing. Because uh, his father, they thought his father was just a businessman and a jazz musician, um, sax, jazz sax. Um, and um, they had no idea he was uh, the chief in the Middle East of the CIA. Wow. Um, and when they found out, they kind of like rebelled against that. Uh, that was just that was too too corporate man <laughs> wow um yeah no, but, he told me he told me quite a bit and, and that's where the police and illegal records oh. and ira records come from i see it's the rebellious side of them i see well, that's where that, that's where the names came from what about the lovely suzanne george did you? Oh, Susan George, brilliant, lovely lady, absolutely gorgeous. She'd produced, she'd released a, a record, and um, I went along to the uh, the press day, um, and um, she posed for me, and I, I set up how I wanted to photograph her, and um, yeah, she she was really cool, uh, lovely 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 lady, yeah. Um, yeah. But you know, with with all of these people, as a photographer, you're in, you photograph them, and you're gone. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, absolutely. You're lucky. You're lucky if you then see them again. I, you were talking about, you were asking about who's the most difficult. Well, I thought actually that Keith Moon would be one of the most difficult ones to photograph. Um, and again, that was at the Cannes Film Festival a couple, a few months before he died. Um, he. Because I, you know, visions of the, this destructive nature of the Who and the throwing TVs out of the hotel windows and all that sort of thing. But no, I, when I met him in person to photograph him, um, and John Entwistle, uh, it, he was so polished. He was well spoken, posh almost, and very polite. Total shock. Yeah, and I, I've heard that of him because he, he was quite a philanthropist as well, despite the fact that it, most of it was drug and alcohol infused. But, you know, yeah. he, he he supplied instruments to a local cadet force. He, he, he was very passionate about what he did and very, very enthusiastic, let's say. But 
Yeah, what a, what a great shame. Of course, I mean, you're talking about an era of musicians when they were musicians, where they had to write music or form music, yes. where it wasn't processed, and it's you know, photography's gone the same way. Uh, as I say, everybody could be a musician now because all they have to do is press a button and there'll be a computer that will form it for them. But and if they can't sing, they've got a piece of software that'll actually put them into tune. Yeah, absolutely, which which cannot be right. But, I mean, as I say, you've photographed some of the most iconic people, and I accept that you don't form relationships with these people, mm. but you spend time in their company, which there's th- th- millions of people that never get that opportunity. I, I, I'm, I'm in awe. I, there's two things. One, I'm a very, very keen photographer, but I don't have the skill set. You know, if if I had a film camera, they'd be mediocre. Thank God for for digital and Photoshop now, because I can take a, a, a tidy photograph. But you know, Lee Marvin, you 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 took a photograph of Lee Marvin. Now you probably only spent three or four minutes with him. But no, I actually, I spent I spent a, a, a complete a whole day. Did you? Um, I was on the film set of. Shout at the Devil in Malta. Right. Um, they have a water tank there, which um, the end of the water tank actually is is flush with the sea, so it it's like continuous water. Um, and they built um, the battleship there, um, scaffold polding, uh, scaffold poles, and and all, and, and tarpaulin. So very clever, really was. So it looks so real on the screen. But we spent time with uh, Lee Marvin, Roger Moore, Barbara Parkins, and um, we had a a wonderful time. Uh, We were flown down there by the um, director, and, um, yeah, it was a really cool time. And uh, he was most accommodating. He really was. Very nice chap. Very, very hard man as well. I think he was a Marine during, during the Second World War. Um, yeah, I think he had a, a military history to him, but yeah, very very hard man. Same as Charles Bronson, you know, both very very hard people. Anyone that you wish you had had the opportunity to photograph? Oh, good grief! Um, I'm nosy, aren't I? Off, off, the top, off the top of my head, uh, no, I can't think of anybody. Uh, no, I can't think of anybody I would have really wanted to photograph that I never got to. Um, yeah, I, I mean, just got to photograph so many. Well, yeah, and that, and that's the thing. You've done some incredible things, but of course, you've taken photographs of the late Queen Mother. Um, the, the she cup- was delightful, was she? I, I, yeah, I, I, I had a patch over my eye at the time. And um, she paused and she looked at me and we, we spoke and uh, um, she said, uh, must be difficult taking pictures with uh, only one eye. Um, I said, yes, ma'am. Um, yeah, it was, but I, you know, managed it. And then she actually posed for me. So oh. that was nice. And uh, yeah, a special moment. And of course, you photographed the king when he was Prince Charles. Yeah, I was at Belmarsh Prison. Oh, was it? I was I was commissioned by the governor um, to go and photograph his visit there, and follow him around as he met the prisoners and guests. Um, and uh, it's just one of those moments. So uh, he was chatting to people, and I'm taking pictures. Um, and uh, yeah. He, he was really nice because I, uh, following him around, I, I got into one of these small corridors, and I thought, "Crap, I'm 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 in the way." Um, so I sort of hunkered into the side wall. I'm a big bloke, so I, I hunkered into the side wall to allow him to go past. And as he as he got next to me, he sort of wry smile on his face. <laughs> <laughs> and off he went. Um, but yeah, no, he's a nice chap. Um, a few words to me, so yeah, fantastic. Yeah. And and then of course you met Her Majesty the Queen. Ah, well, two thousand five, 
a highlight moment. Yes. I was booked by the borough commander, Robin Merritt, to be the official photographer for the visit to Bexley uh, by Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth. And there was the usual walk through reconnoiter, reconnoiter, reconnoiter? Yeah. yeah, reconnoiter, with local officials and, of course, royalty protection. Uh, the officer took me to one side and said, uh, I could follow Her Majesty during her visit, but if I got too close, he would tap me on the shoulder. And then he reminded me he was armed. <laughs> his, his little joke. <laughs> um, all went well. I found myself in between them. Well, again, I found myself in the wrong place. You know, I was as as Robin Merritt is escorting her back to her limousine. I'm actually in the way, so I step up onto the steps of uh, Bexley Heath Nick, um, and I'd not been schooled in the correct etiquette, uh, but I knew to move to one side, get out of the way. Um, and as the borough commander and Her Majesty got next to me, he suddenly paused and said, uh, Your Majesty, may I introduce you to our photographer, Peter Bayliss? And it's like the ground opened up. <laughs> I failed to bow. I didn't address her properly uh, in the proper manner. And my brain went a little bit fuzzy. Um, into overdrive and I said uh, I understand your majesty prefers the light camera and you have an extensive collection of pictures she smiled and made a sort of yes noise <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and said how, it, how important it was to record such events she turned and she was gone couldn't make that up no. but at the same time you see on that same day I met her again because I was the chair of the Wellingtown Forum, um, the the group basically that uh, got me involved in the police. Um, uh, because I was the chair, I was invited to the community lunch. Wow! And I sat I sat two tables away from her. <laughs> she said that man's stalking before, me. But <laughs> before before that, she we were all divided up. All of these, I mean, there was a hundred odd people there. But we were all divided up in small groups of six. And she went from group to group to group. And she was introduced um, to us by first name. And it came to our, my group. And this is uh, Peter. Um, he's the chair of the community forum. And she looked at me. Pause for a second there. She looked at me as if, as if, as if she was thinking, yeah, we think we've seen one somewhere before. <laughs> <laughs> oh. um, Oh, and uh, and uh, she said, uh, isn't it wonderful the way they've um, renovated this old house, the, the mansion house in Danson Park? And I said, um, uh, I'd been schooled then, all right? It's ma'am, not mom. Yeah, ma'am. Mom's old-fashioned. She liked the ma'am, which is more modern. Ma'am as in I ham. said, yes, ma'am. Um, I used to come here as a child with my parents and have uh, ice cream and teas on the uh, terrace. No, oh, she says. With that, she turned and she was gone. <laughs> so <laughs> that was a, a second nice moment in one day. Um, yeah. So, so you, I'm going to take you back to a couple of points that you raised earlier on. You, yeah. you, you're working in Fleet Street yeah. as, a, as a youngster, and the the – print world was gritty wasn't it i mean you had to work and you had to work bloody hard in order to achieve and you know the unions were very strong in in fleet street at that particular time don't get me started on unions no we won't go down that route we don't we, we but but the whole face of the print and photography was completely different to what it is now i mean you, I, I worked at the baseball on the weekend and the photographer there was zapping as many photographs as they wanted and put them on a card into the back of their Apple phone and they were sent back to the editor in, yeah. in the States. I mean, in, in an absolute heartbeat. But to capture that one shot as a young photojournalist, how did you know you had that shot? Because you've only got 30-odd well, Exposure. Yeah, 36, 36 frames, and um, 
more often than not, you'd use that 36 frames um, pretty rapidly. Yeah. And you keep your fingers crossed that one frame out of that would be just subtly different from the others and just make the grade. Right. More often than not, more often than not they didn't. You know, they were just average pictures. But every so often, you got a picture which was unique. Yeah. Um, uh, I went to see Mel Brooks, who was giving a Guardian lecture at BAFTA one year, uh, talking about his work. Now, I had a motor-driven camera. I'm sitting in the aisles between the seating, and um, I'm sort of pressing the shutter, and it's quite a noisy camera. Yeah. Um, and all of a sudden, he, I think, I, I think it pissed him off, to be honest with you. <laughs> uh, at one point, he, 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 he looked, looked in my direction. He stood up, leant forward over the coffee table, and made this face at me. Um, and uh, I had the briefest second to change the focus and zoom slightly and press the button, and I got three frames one of which was absolutely pin sharp perfect fantastic and it wasn't until probably some years later that i realized that what he was doing was a gooky now do you know the marx brothers yes. right harpo marx the one who didn't talk yes uh, in the 1920s the story goes he would be waiting outside uh, a shop in Fifth Avenue. In the back of the shop was his older brother gambling. And the window of the shop was this short, squat, Italian-American called Gookie. Right. And he'd hand roll cigars all day long. And as he was concentrating, his face contorted and he made this expression. Now, Harpo learnt how to do this, so he used it in his stage act, because they were a stage act then, before films. Um, and he'd do it at the window, and Gookie would get annoyed and chase him, couldn't catch him. So that was the, goo the, the origins of the Gookie. Well, I never. Um, and when he, when he actually sort of purses his lips and, and, and pulls this face on film, that's the Gookie. Um, so Mel Brooks had done, uh, blown a gookie at me and he, he's very rarely in his, in his, in his life. He's now in his late nineties, I think, yeah. uh, he's very rarely in his life blown a gookie at anybody. So I got the picture. There was an, another time working with the parachute regiment. Um, <clears throat> I was, it was four o'clock in the morning and with the pathfinders, uh, we're yomping across wherever it was, and, and we get to a field, and we're on our bellies crawling. And flare goes up from the opposite camp. So we press our faces into the ground, and I'm trying to protect my camera gear. Um, and then all of a sudden, all hell breaks loose. There's trace of fire and and and, and explosions. Um, we'd been spotted. The, the 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 one thing I would say that while my while my I'm I'm prone on the ground from the left somewhere in the distance, I hear this this like a, an army of ants coming across the fields, and uh, it was the parachute regiment and and. It just sounded so weird. It really did. Um, and and all of a sudden, it, all hell breaks loose. So I'm up, I'm running across, and I hit barbed wire. I go arse over tit. <laughs> One camera goes into the deck. The other camera I've got, I'm hanging on to for dear life. Um, and I'm sitting there, sort of winded, and it's pitch black. There's all of this nonsense going on. I thought, I'm, uh, uh, I've got a roll of film, uh, transparency film in, in the camera. 
um, in the dark. I set the lens to what I think is infinity. I turn all the dials so it's uh, the correct speed, etc. And I just hold it, uh, set the, the motor to continuous drive, hold it up in the air and just press the press the tip. 36 exposures. Get back to London, and I've got something like 52 rolls of film. Bloody hell. Take them into the lab and get them to process. And I said, that one, do not cut it up. Just process only. Do not cut it. Well, when I went back there next day, um, that roll of film was unrolled on the light box, and it was just one long black piece of film being transparency. And there was one frame, one frame in the middle of that roll of an explosion as it hit the soldier who tripped the wire. Oh, no. And the soldier in front of him was not yet blown off his feet. And that explosion actually illuminated the scene just enough for my camera. Uh, that was embargoed by the MOD for 10 years. How did you get invited along to this as a, a gig? What you... I found out the Ministry of Defence said, can I go and work with Parachute Regiment? I found with... out the Ministry of Defence said, can I go and, uh, um, down in a, a submarine, please? And you did that as well? Uh, yeah, I found out the American Air Force said, can I, uh, can I fly with an F- 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 F-111, please? You never. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I was a passenger in an F one eleven. That was um, that was in Norfolk. Yeah, it was in Norfolk. That's incredible. In, in those days, you could get away with those things. You could do them. You know, you phoned up, you asked politely. Yep. And so there were certain rules and regulations and things you couldn't do. Um, and air, all, all my pictures had to be vetoed. Um, of course. Uh, but, you know, it, it was just one of those things. Um, I was in Athens once and um, uh, in a hotel, a five-star hotel, okay? It was for an ABTA conference, Association of British, British Travel Agents. Yep. And uh, I come down, I'd got nothing to do. Um, oh, that's right, yes. It was um, not only that, but I found there was a film being shot there, Uh and I can't for the life of me remember the name of the film, but I contacted the um, the, the director, and he said, "Well, look, Pete, it's 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 piddling now with rain, mate. You know, you, you, we're not doing anything on the set at the moment, but if you hang around, um, when it dries up, I'll give you a shout, and you come out take some pictures. Okay, thanks. Cool. Um, so in the meantime, I've got nothing to do, so I wandered downstairs, and as I'm passing the banqueting hall. There's two monsters standing on security on the doors. And I, through the open doors, I see admirals and generals <laughs> and God knows what else uh, with so much salad across their uniforms and all these medals. And I'm thinking, hello, what is this? <laughs> 60th anniversary celebration of the Russian Revolution. Wow. They were Russians. So I showed my press, my international press card to one of the guys on the door and he just ushered me in. So there I am. I'm photographing all of these people. Uh, Lugene Lewistic came up to me. He was the translator. Um, and he said, oh, nice to meet you, etc. Um, so I said, can I get captions for these? Uh, he said, yes, yeah, come down to the embassy. Here's, a, here's my card. Show that at the gate. So the next day after I processed the films and made contact sheets, um, I took them all down to the Russian embassy, uh, pressed the bell. And this, 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 this embassy is, is huge, and it's, it's, it's clad with iron bars and, and, and a real fortress. So this, this, this guy comes to the, ga- uh, the gate, and... He's built like a shit brick house. <laughs> oh, brick shit house. Uh, you know, he is short, he is <laughs> wide, and he's got a he's he's got a crew cut that's just unbelievable across his head. Uh, not a word of English, but I showed him the card, and I was ushered in. 
Um, I met uh, Eugene and he said, um, let me have the, the, the pictures and I'll, I'll get some captions for you. So off he went and I sat down and waited. Uh, a while later, he came back and he said, Peter, um, I hope you don't mind, but we've actually taken two of the negatives and the two of the contacts, uh, the, the, the contacts of those negatives, and we're going to keep those if you don't mind. Um, what was I going to say? No. I was on Russian soil. Yeah. I was inside the Russian embassy. It was the Cold War, all right, that was going on. Wow. And I wanted out of there. So I said, yeah, of course, of course, of course, no problems at all. I got my captions. And then he said, uh, my undersecretary wants to meet you and uh, come down. So he came down. We went off into a side kitchen. And out comes a, a bottle, a clear liquid, uh, no label on it, and uh, some glasses, tiny glasses and um, pretzels. And... Um, the undersecretary then just started talking in Russian. He went on and on and on and on. And Eugene then translated to me. He said, my undersecretary wishes to um, uh, send good wishes from uh, uh, west to east. And um, thanks you for coming in today with your pictures and wishes you success. Uh, oh, he said a lot more than that, mate. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so there I was, and uh, to be honest with you, that, that stuff was strong. And uh, after a few of those, anyway, left there. Pictures went back to a picture agency in London. And I dare say that those pictures did actually end up on the desk of a security service somewhere. Of course, <laughs> of, course. of course they did. But yeah, you know that's just just the way it went. I got lucky time after time, uh, being invited in and and treated well. Um, um, yeah, but but you make your own luck, don't you? I mean, th there's a photograph that you took of um, Pete Townsend with David Essex. Yeah, uh, again, that was the Cannes Film Festival. Oh, was um, it? The Who were there for a concert at Frisius, a place called Frisius, and uh, I went to the party there, and there was David Essex, and they were talking, and uh, I was the only photographer standing there. So, uh, guys, can I get a couple of pictures? Yeah, sure, no problems. And, they, and so they played played up for the camera, Fantastic. and I got the picture. David Cassidy um, as well. I mean, yeah. these are these are iconic people. People listening to this podcast, there's 98 countries that that receive this podcast at the moment i'd like to get it to 100 but there'll be people we're, we're talking about people that are recognized across the globe yeah and you know the, the picture of david cassidy coming out of it looks like a concert or similar it's coming out of the first night uh leicester square theater leicester square leicester square theater cinema uh, he was coming up with the first night, and he was absolutely mobbed. Yeah. And I was probably one of the luckier um, of the, the, the cameras there. I just got the picture. Yeah. Brilliant. Uh, luck. So I'm going to I'm going to take you back again. So you're hmm. in um, in the Soho area, and you decide that you're going to go home to Gerrard Street, which is uh, Chinatown, part of Chinatown. Yeah. Where, where you are viciously assaulted by uh, uh, some Sunderland fans. What what year yeah. was that? Oh, early 80s, uh, 81, 82, something like that. Right. I can't remember. Honestly. I mean, you know, I'm what, there's a, there's a, the jam um, did a song which includes a lyric about my life spun around me. But what, what was, how, how did you react? when you were assaulted and what was the basis of their their attack well uh, we will never know because they were gone by the right. time i came round um i was being picked up out of the gasa by a, a cabbie uh, who said uh, look mate, i saw what happened um i'll drive you down to west end central nick yeah and um you can report this to the police so i uh, sort of staggered into his his cab and off he goes and as we get halfway down, I think it was Beak Street, 
He pulled over, opened the cab door and said, but how'd you get, mate? It's just down the road there, all right? You cross over and it's, it's Savile Row, all right? And yeah. the next there. And I'm standing there dazed and in to his cab gets six Japanese tourists. <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> he saw money <laughs> and got rid of me. Oh. Um, so I wandered over there to the police station. I sat down. I told them what had happened. There was nothing they could do. It's long gone, done, dusted. How many how many football supporters were in London that, that Friday night? You know, um, no CCTV. Nothing. There was no, nothing like no, that. Then. Not then. Um, so I, I was I was steered off to hospital. Um, X rayed uh, in case of a head injury. And then I managed to get myself back to my digs. Uh, the next morning I woke up, uh, I opened my eyes. So the swelling in my right eye had gone down. So I opened my eyes and all of a sudden the light above me and the ceiling split into two. Oh. And I knew I had a problem. So wherever I looked, everything was splitting into two because the right eye was fixed. Um, what had happened, the punch had been so hard that it split the orbit oh. and the um, the muscles and tissues that, that pull the eye around um, were trapped in that split. So wow. I spent three years plus going backwards and forwards to Moorfields Eye Hospital. Yeah. Um, I had a very lovely lady looking after me, uh, Miss Tasker Watkins. Um, her, her husband is recovering, who was recovering from cancer at the time, 32 years of age, oh. Rodri Tasker Watkins, uh, the son of Lord Tasker Watkins, the man who, um, oversaw the Abafan disaster inquiry. Oh, wow. Um, so it's, it's quite surprising who you bump into at times. And he became a good friend, and he, he's, I had uh, lunch with him a few times, and uh, um, he advised me on, in areas of being, um, and, and then unfortunately he died oh. of cancer. Mm. Um, yeah, so, you know, I was, I was back on my feet, but I'd lost my confidence. I'd lost my confidence, and I played it kind of safe by working for banks and financial institutions and technology companies um, like Hewlett Packard, etc. you know, photographing these huge computers. And, um, yeah, I, 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 I also got into things like desktop publishing. Right. Um, my, my father's roots were in printing, and I saw this new thing called desktop publishing, so I immediately got on a plane and flew to um, Massachusetts, uh, where one of the main manufacturers was for this uh, desktop publishing system. Um, and then I flew on to Salinas in California. And while in Salinas, I had lunch at the Hogshead and met uh, Clint Eastwood. <laughs> um, <laughs> it was just, As you just bizarre. It was a bizarre, but then, you know, I, it just happened. And, I, and <laughs> I, the um, the software company was called Ventura in um, Salinas, California. And each company gave me boxes of their software right. to bring back to London. And so I sat down on, on a, um, a very early IBM personal computer and learned how to use this stuff. Um. And I, I was, uh, it, was a, it was a period when I didn't have much work. Right. I didn't have much confidence. And so I was, I was signing on. Right. And uh, they sent me to, uh, on a course, all right, this, this company in North London that um, taught unemployed people how to basically get back into the work field. Well, I thought I'd go, you know, along and, and see what it was all about. Well, uh, their computer course uh, was quite basic. Yeah. And they soon realized that I knew more than they were teaching. 
Um, and then they turned around to me within a day or so and said, Peter, can we offer you a job? <laughs> so, you know, as I've said before, I'm, I'm, I'm up for a challenge. So I said, okay, fine, great. So there I was teaching desktop publishing, something I'd only just learned, to a class of 30 unemployed people. <laughs> How cool is that? I'm standing there in front of them, right? Dry mouth, wet armpits, bricking it and making it up as I went along. <laughs> that first course of 30 people, uh, it was a, a good few weeks, uh, was by the seat of my pants and I made a number of mistakes. But the second course got better and the third course was brilliant. And by the third course, my name was going onto their CVs uh, as a reference point. So I was basically, the, all those CVs were going out like a, a public relations thing for yeah. me, going out to banks and financial institutions where they were applying for jobs. Um, so I was able to go along later and, and, and black some work as a photographer with those companies. Wow. Now, the lady who taught them how to do their CVs, uh, Rachel, uh, unfortunately, um, one, uh, I think it was one Saturday night, um, a former friend of her boyfriend, a recent boyfriend, um, knocked on the door and was piddling down outside. And I've got nowhere to stay. Can, I, can you put me up on your couch? Uh, yeah, okay, because she knew him. Um, but he was high on something, and he knifed her to death. Oh, no. Yeah, something like 40 stabs and just hacked her to bits while she slept. And who was she? She was the lady at the, this company who taught the adults how to produce a decent CV, oh. and she gave them assistance on applying for jobs and how to talk to people for getting a job. And we came in on the Monday and we were all grouped together and we were told the sad news. Oh, that's terrible. Yeah. That is terrible. So, uh, oh, that is terrible. I, didn't, I didn't stay there much longer. Um, no. it, it just soured me. Yeah. And uh, so then I went out um, and the moment, I, the moment the people out there realised I was out there freelancing, uh, they were using me. Brilliant. So, yeah. So, you, so you 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 volunteer for the Metropolitan Police. Yeah. And and you start on a doing five days, seven days, back to five days, blah blah blah. And they realise that there is a value to what you do, and they start paying a, a yes su sum to do. Uh, 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 Commander had found a small budget, uh, about ten k, I think it was. And um, so he said, uh, you bill us for each job you do and um, we'll pay you. OK, fine. Great. So I just went on and it, it grew from there. Um, that lasted for about four or five years as a freelance. Right. Um, and I was covering everything they could throw at me. Um, the... Uh, um, well, is there, I suppose by about 2006, the word had spread. There was a civilian with the ability to record and I hope do justice to the work of officers, officers who by then were willing to be photographed. And I was trusted. Right. Not only, not only in Bexley, but across the Met. Fantastic. Um, uh, I uh, by that time I'd, I'd produced and directed uh, some videos for the Met. Right. Um, that earned me a Borough Commander's commendation as well as one from the Assistant Commissioner. Um, interest came in from a variety of OCUs and BOCUs. Um, my security clearance had uh, been bumped up to second highest at anti-terrorist level. Um, I was in much demand. Um, much the chagrin of my line manager, a lovely lady, Leslie Williams, uh, whom I can say is a lifelong friend. 
we were, were we worked so closely together that even her husband referred to me as the other <laughs> husband. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. Uh, and, and some people, some people actually, it, 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 when they came into the Nick, thought we were married. We got on so well together. How funny! Um, after the 2005 London terrorist attacks, all the relevant agencies put special plans into motion, uh, and those uh, include operations Wooden Pride, 2006, seven, and eight. I think it was yes. A mere civilian on jollies photographing operatives from departments with an array of initials. Mm. <laughs> I mean, you know, Wooden Pride was brilliant because you've got the SAS, the SBS there. You've got uh, MI5, MI6. You've got all sorts of people um, rehearsing the worst case scenario. You've got uh, one, of the, uh, one of the Wooden Prides, you've got... Uh, uh, RAF helicopters hovering over the um, what's that um, thing that goes across the Thames to stop the water coming through the Thames oh, the barrier. barrier? Yeah. All right. Um, the, inside the base of the Thames barrier, it's all hollow. So you've got um, you've got ex-army amputees pretending to be victims of explosions. Um, they're the victims. Uh, you've got other soldiers in there um, wearing. Arab garb and, and carrying Kalashnikovs, um, uh, pretending to be the bad terrorists. And it's up to the SAS and the SBS to get in there and um, kill, kill, kill the bad guys and rescue the hostages. And when you've got SAS being roped down at <laughs> 2 a.m. in the morning um, and uh, the people coming out of their houses, thinking, what the is going on here? <laughs> <laughs> That's brilliant. Um, you know, there's me, a civilian, all right? I'm, I'm in the middle of this jolly that's going on, and I'm having a thoroughly good time. I'm photographing stuff I'm really not supposed to see. But anyway, um, great pictures. You can't, great un pictures. You can't unsee it. How, no. how on earth did you get involved with the NYPD at the 28th Precinct? Again. Um, you asked. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I asked. I did ask. I went to let's see. One of my first trips to America was to Boston, and I thought it'd be fun to go and see the Boston PD. And um, uh, I went to. I phoned them up and said, uh, "Can I go and photograph the police officers out on patrol?" Um, yeah, okay, fine. Um, so uh, uh, I went to the Roxburgh district, the number two district in Roxburgh. Well, and uh, no, well, uh, <laughs> it was bad news territory. Yeah, it really was. It was bandit territory. Um, and I'm in the back of a car, and the, the two officers in front of me, Billy and Billy. I remember that. <laughs> um, and um, we we were five minutes out from the precinct, and bang! There's an explosion at the side of the vehicle. Oh, I jumped and what the hell was that? And he said, "Oh, it's uh, you know, don't worry, don't worry about it. It's just kids throwing rocks at the cars. <laughs> the way they speak, the cars. <laughs> um, and the kids, there's no streetlights. They've all been put out. You know, they've been shot out. Wow." So uh, that was my first experience of working with police. And then I came down by bus to New York. I thought, well, I wonder if I could do the NYPD. So I phoned up number one police plaza. Yep. And I said, I've just been in the Roxburgh district um, with the uh, Boston PD. Um, can I go somewhere and photograph officers um, uh, doing their jobs and get a story maybe? And they said, yeah, sure, no problems. Gave me an address. I walked out of Penn Central, held a cab. It's got a big yellow monster box thing that turns up, you know. And that was my first experience when I came out of JFK once. The first time out of JFK, I stood there, and these great big yellow boxes on wheels are going past. I'm thinking, <laughs> wow, I'm in America. I'm in America, And there's, yeah. and there's, there's, there's a policeman with a gun on his hip. Wow. 
<laughs> Incredible. Um, I got in the cab, and I'm not kidding you, the cab driver was almost as wide as two seats. <laughs> he was black. He was huge. Um, I said, I need to go to that address. And he goes, uh, that's Harlem, man. Oh, I don't go to Harlem. <laughs> <laughs> I, did, I didn't know what Harlem was. Right. Okay. And this was the 70, early 70s, mid 70s. So we get to the 28 precinct. I tell him it's the 28 precinct in Harlem. Oh, okay. Clunk. The door locks go down straight away. And we're going through uh, Manhattan, Central Park. We're going into Spanish Harlem. Yeah. And then Harlem proper. And as you're progressing through New York, you see it go down the toilet. Yeah, you do. It's getting worse and worse and worse. And there's great gaps between buildings where buildings have been burned down to the ground. Insurance jobs, all insurance jobs. Um, so I get to the 28 and I go in and say, hi, I've been sent down from police plaza to see and take some pictures. And the first officer I met was Richard Hayward. And he became a lifelong friend until his death. Um, which was what uh, year before last, um, and um, yeah. So uh, he said, well, "Where are you staying?" Oh, I haven't got anywhere yet. He said, "Right, you're coming out to Queens, and you're staying with me and the wife." Ah, oh, okay, fine. So you know, and uh, you know, it's, it's so 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 kind was he that he would have a he would um, a, 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 a clam bake. All right, a barbecue yeah. and a clam bake in his back garden, and he'd invite all of his neighbours and friends in to meet the Englishman. <laughs> I was treated like royalty. That is so cool. First night out with the on patrol with them, uh, we got back and there was a hole through the siren on the top of the roof, and they were looking at it and said, "Oh, somebody's taken a pop shot at us. Somebody had shot a bullet through that wow. siren." I'm sitting in the back of this thing. <laughs> so it's basically gone over my head. Through. Uh, and um, and there was one point when I was with Richard, um, I decided to go into the city on my own. And um, I went in and I went around the uh, subway system and got out at one point and walked around the streets and back onto the subway and uh, said to got a bit lost and I asked this guy for directions and he looked at me rather strangely and he said yeah over there um, so when I got back to Richards uh, what would you do today <laughs> and, blah, 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 blah. and their mouths went oh, Peter you did what you went where yeah you were, you were in Harlem on your own a white man Peter you, you, you don't ever do that white people have gone into Harlem and they've never come out never been seen again no, never seen again. And uh, it, it was quite bad because we saw some bad things and saw a lot of dead bodies. Yeah. Um, you know, we've got pictures of dead bodies. Uh, I was allowed to walk into crime scenes. There were seven bodies in one apartment one day. Um, Santa Dominicans from the South Bronx. And it was suspected that they were cutting heroin in this hotel in Harlem. Um, with permission of the local mob um, on the basis that they didn't sell in Harlem. Right. And what they reckon is, that it's all theories, of course, uh, is that somebody had tried to buy some heroin and was refused because of this this, this edict. Yeah. And, and um, so they dropped a dime. Um, and they dropped a dime to the bad guys because uh, they say you dropped a dime to make the phone work. No, that's, that's the expression, yeah. uh, drop, dropping a dime. And um, uh, so um, the bad guys went in, waited for them, and as they arrived, they tied them up, they slit their throats and shot them for good measure. And there were seven. There were two on the bed, and the rest were on the floor. And I was allowed to go into the scene and, and 
I managed to get a couple of shots and then I was ushered out. I don't publish those. I mean, you know, it's it's just just one of those things. I've got those pictures and yeah, no, you don't publish those. You've but you've got those forever and ever. Amen, haven't you? That's the uh... yeah, that's right. It, it shows you the sort of thing that they actually have to put up with that oh, we don't have to put up with. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I have this conversation with American law enforcement about guns. You know, they don't get it that we don't have guns. Well, I'm bloody glad we don't. Yeah. Well, Although there are enough guns on the streets of the UK, as it is, that have come in from Europe. There are, yeah. But you, you know yeah. exactly – you know that the person brandishing that firearm is uh, illegal – that, that's where it differs. If, if, if a copper turns up in South East London and someone's got a gun there, then there's only one reason why they've got it is for bad things. Whereas in the States, it's, if you turn up, they've all got the right to have guns and it's a right yeah. bl- bloody mess. Yeah. But. The uh, Second Amendment of the Constitution. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. The right to bear arms. At the time it was written, it was written for muskets and yeah, muzzle exactly. loading single shot weapons. Exactly. Not something that they are forties. No, fires a hundred rounds before you can say fish and chips. Yeah. <laughs> when you yeah, when you're in the you're in the Metropolitan Police, did you actually get employed in the Met eventually? Yeah. Yeah. In um, uh, let's see, where was it? It was um, that was two thousand and ten. Um, Barack Obama walked into the office, said, "Peter, uh, we've got a slight problem." Uh, we're in trouble with the inland revenue. Uh, <laughs> apparently, they've got a regulation that says um, we're only allowed to keep you on as a on a freelance basis for six months, right? Not five years. So, uh, as of Friday, you're no longer working for us as a freelance photographer. Oh, and I thought, oh God, I lost my job. That's it. He said, it's within my purview to actually employ a person. Uh, even though it's a low band E. So Monday, you're working for us. Oh, wow. No interview or anything. Yeah, this, I Straight just got in. the job. And that was it. Monday, I uh, went to HR and, uh, and uh, did all the paperwork. Um, uh, and again, signed the Official Secrets Act. And um, I was working full time for the Met until Theresa May stepped in. Mm. <laughs> we'll come to that. Now, yeah. I, after. after after the wooden pride operations, I, I was I was all of a sudden in demand. Um, uh, I was occasionally seconded again, much to the chagrin of Leslie, um, to MSU, ASU, DPG, TSU, Prison Intelligence Unit, hostage and negotiation, covert command, and more. Uh, I was rocking around in boats and helicopters, running around with armed units on jobs and exercises. <laughs> At 2 a.m., it, it was way cooler than a nine-to-five job. I can tell you that for yeah. sure. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Did you go to Lippitz Hill and go up in the helicopter? And, and yeah, the yeah, Lippitz was wonderful because um, you know, I was given sort of free reign to photograph it. I'm on the ground uh, inches away from the helicopter, um, laying on the ground with a camera, pointing upwards as the thing's taking off. And what really what really fascinated me about that was that the helicopter is running its motor for a considerable amount of time before it really spins up as it takes off. And the downdraft from that is, is, is yeah, something you never you don't you don't forget those things. It's incredible, isn't it? Yeah. I had the best job ever. Oh well, yeah, you, you certainly did. Um uh, I've just seen his name come up on a on a flash. Phil, he was at Lippitz. I don't suppose you remember all the people that you worked with over there and during the during your time. No, no, it's it's it, it's it's one of those things, you know. You meet people for a few minutes, yeah, and, yeah. and um, you you've got a job to do, so you're concentrating on that. Um, and then you say goodbye to them and uh, thanks them and thank them for their, their 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 hospitality. Yeah. When you when you're in the office, did you move into New Scotland Yard? Is that was that or did you stay? No, no, no you always no, no. you always stayed the, on the borough. The the, the the New Scotland Yard had media and communications. Right. All right. Um, but it was too far away from the boroughs. 
Hence the reason Chris Cerrone wanted his own local media right. and comms unit. Much to the chagrin of media and comms at the yard. Of course. Because they didn't, they didn't want to lose control. No. They it didn't. was their job, mm. you know? This is our job. This is not your job. This is our job. It was that mentality. Yeah. Yeah. It still is their mentality. Yeah, absolutely. And they got their way, as I say, after Theresa May cut the budget for UK policing. Yeah, we've never Everything went. Never recovered. The properties went first. Um, the assets, the crown jewels went. Yeah. Um, and then the, all the bandees went. Um, and soon after that, the bandees went. But there you... were about 4,000 people who lost their jobs in uh, the Met across London. Wow. Not known much. It's no, about, but it's something like that. And they still haven't recovered from it. They no. still haven't recovered from it. And I, I do feel, and I'm not going to go into one of my rants, but when you're given the news that you're surplus to requirements, how did that make you feel? Uh, given, well, in 2013, given all the hard work, that you've the writing done. was on the wall. Right. Um, New Scotland Yard Media had decided our department was to close and there was to be another revamp of the Met, for which I was booked to make the internal commun and community video. <laughs> nice. Well, at the end of the year, um, uh, I was in the middle of editing this thing and um, it was assumed I'd had a heart attack. Oh. Um, I awoke in hospital to find my last borough commander, Peter Ayling. Yeah. Wonderful, wonderful bloke. He's now Assistant Chief Constable Kent. He is. Uh, he was standing at the foot of the bed, showing concern as to how I was. Uh, it's a very special person who does that. Mm. Um, so it took me six months to recover. And while recovering, um, uh, I was sent a note from my then line manager at uh, Media and Comms saying, um, oh, look, sorry we've not been in touch. We didn't actually know for a month that you'd actually gone into a hospital. Mm. Took them a month to find out one of theirs had gone down. And uh, they said, um, you, you do realise, of course, that if you don't come back immediately to work, your pay is going to go down to 50 percent yeah so uh, all right okay i couldn't uh, i got bills to pay so i went back to work and i found myself sitting in an empty office uh, instructions from uh, before leslie left she received instructions from them to delete all files all pictures, all files to be deleted, completely gone. So when I said, well, what about a historic record? Not interested. Delete everything. Sod that. I copied them onto CDs and took them home. Yeah. I've got 1,700 CDs next to me. Right Bloody now. hell. Yeah. These pictures are history. And every, so, every once in a while, I'm contacted by somebody who says, look, we've got the 50th anniversary of the DPG coming up. Do you have any pictures, Peter? Two, right, I've got pictures, mate. Yeah. And I've supplied them with pictures. Yeah, it's, it, it is. Um, this is why we do what we do here, because it's the history that we're capturing. You know, yeah. the, these conversations about the lovely Suzanne George – Keith Moon, Roger Dawkins, all the, this is social history. These are the things that won't go on Sky Arts or BBC <laughs> Four because these are it's it's not their thing. And but we need to capture this this history because when we go, we go, and and our history goes with us. Yeah, that's terrible. Yeah, but then it was all coming to an end. Um, what year uh, was that? By the time uh, I was well enough to return to work, it was an empty office, as I say. Yeah. Zero contact with NSY. Um, they, uh, as I said, they took a month to discover I'd been in hospital and I had no work. 
That's terrible. I had to turn up at nine o'clock in the morning and sit there all day and go home at five o'clock. And it was soul destroying. Bloody miserable. Um and that that lasted that lasted for about six months. So I'm wandering around the net with my camera, um, finding things to photograph, um, not doing anything, basically. Uh, 30th of June, so it's coming up to the 10th anniversary. Yeah, it is. Yeah, uh, we're, yeah we're in June now. Mm. 30th of June, 2014, after touring the building, saying a last goodbye to workmates. That was a hell of a lot of people. I completed the paperwork, signed that document, and handed over my pass. I left the building, sat down on the bench outside in the street, and I cried. Yeah, I bet you did, mate. The next two, two years were at the lowest ebb. Um, I, I, my, I just, my clinical depression just bang, hit me. First time... Clinical depression was after I was mugged by the football supporters. Mm. That's when it, that was the first time I'd ever suffered depression because I was a big bloke. I was strong. I could look after myself, or so I thought. And somebody had, had really battered my world. Um, yeah, and then my parents, when they died, that was a low ebb. But I picked myself up each time. Bounce back. It's about uh, feeling yeah, valued, I'm... isn't it? Sorry? We, we all want to be valued. Yeah, we do. We do, and, yeah. And when you get to a certain uh, age and, and someone says, actually, we don't need you anymore, you think, I've given you heart and soul to provide the best possible service. And I, everyone else can see value in what I do, but you can't. And it's, yeah. it's about that. Um, recognition and valuing. And when I say recognition, plaudits, they help, but they don't mean anything. It's that, it's just the simple thank yous and the the people that ask how you're doing for that day, they're, they're, that's about being valued. So what do you do with your time now, sir? Well, uh, now I'm a state pensioner and I am so, so bored. Are you? But with some fantastic memories. I'm still in touch with some unique people who wore the uniform and also those who, who were civilians. Um, I'm in touch with the uh, uh, detective chief superintendent who's a really good friend of mine. And uh, I've, I've worked closely with his son to help him um, learn about photography for his, his course at school. And... Um, Popped into Marlowe House a few times. Uh, yeah, um, I'm working on a small studio out back in the, um, the what was it, a large shed, uh, building that. Um, and I have got so mu I've got so much baggage, thirty years worth of baggage. You know, we were talking about cameras earlier. I got a box of cameras over there, which is Hasselblads, Rollies, Mamiya's. Uh, right the way back. I've got almost every camera I've ever owned still with me. What do you use now? Uh, I use, let's see, I've got a D800, two D750s, and I've got um, one of the new Z cameras, the Z5. Um, and the uh, lens, uh, the glass I've got is just... That's the well, cost. It's ridiculous. That's the cost. You, you, yeah, you can't get. I've got away one. From it one I've got one lens in front of me right now. Actually, it's a fifteen millimeter, nineteen seventy two um, lens. It's a rectilinear lens. It's fisheye. Right. Yeah. But it's 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 per, it, no distortion on it at all. It was the widest angle lens at the time, and it's probably one of the only ones until present day. Um, that actually had no zero distortion on it, and it is a fabulous lens. I've used it on a number of jobs in the Met um, to great effect. I also used the 10.5 nickel lens, which is a, a fisheye. Um, it has distortion, but hardly any. And I used that, uh, when I use it, I recall, yeah, 10 Downing Street. 
um, DPG officer standing outside. Um, I'm photographing with that. And of course, the building just spreads around. Yeah. All right. It bends. Uh, there's the 10 Downing Street door, and there's the officer standing in front. Lovely picture. Enjoyed it. I'm fairly lonely, actually. I mean, I don't have many friends I can go and, and sit and talk with. Yeah. Um, it's. But the but the art of a photographer is quite a lonely thing anyway, isn't it? Because you're very independent. Yes, you're you're mixing with people if you're doing people, but you're it, it's just you and your camera half the time. Yeah, you're the only person who can take the picture because you're thinking picture, you're thinking exposure, you're thinking yeah, exactly um, composition. Thank you so much for your time today, Peter. I found it absolutely fascinating. Well, I, I didn't know what to expect. Well, um, I hope I hope is, that I've met your expectations. A, this has been a blast. Well, I, I'm very grateful. So thank you so much uh, for You're your welcome. time, and I will speak to you again very soon. Thank you for listening to this episode of X Job Downloaded. Please like, follow, and share. Your support is invaluable.